All right. Hey, uh, listen. And the, who plays the violin? Where's the violin player? Hey, listen, that is fantastic. And we have an away game tonight, and the basketball team, it's, it's hard to play away in away games. Um, because a lot of times we don't have the fans there, and it's just, just quiet. If we could get you to come and play Braveheart before we went out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, use that gift, and you are. That's tremendous. That is tremendous. Everybody, please see everybody up there playing and um, doing such a wonderful job. All right, I'm glad to be back. Now, here's the question I have to ask before I open up in prayer. Honestly, who spent 15 minutes praying last night? Raise your hand. Boy, there are too many hands down. Put your hands down. Thank you for those that did. All right, listen, we got to get into this. Can we invest in this this week? Can we just invest in doing these nightly challenges? Raise your hand if you think you can do it. Come on. Raise your hand. Some of you not raise your hand. The whole middle section in the back. Ridiculous. Okay? Raise your hand. Raise my hand. Let us open this. I wasn't raising my hand. All right, let me open up in prayer. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here again to, to preach on chapel and, and to share with these young people. Lord, it really is my prayer that, that they'll experience an authentic faith that they'll truly sense your presence. And Lord, I mean, just to be real with you as we pray and lift up our voices this morning, if we can't, you know, heed the challenge to pray for 15 minutes, if we can't even remember to take time out for you uh, daily, then we'll never really truly know who you are <coughs> or how you want to work in our life. And this religion or spiritual thing is just going to seem so so dead and so fake and so phony, but it's not. It's not for those who will heed your call to talk with you and walk with you. And So Lord, don't let this just be another week, another message. We really need to, to, to key in. So I pray your Holy Spirit would come and touch hearts this morning. Convict and touch, Lord. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 So at a Christian school, you get, you're, you're bound to get a lot of Bible. I mean, look, I taught yesterday, you have chapel every Wednesday, you have Bible courses, you know, both of you are spending time in prayer. And, but the truth is this, you know, the Bible says that at some point you have to go from milk to solid food, right? And, and for the sake of testimony, I did not show Derek and I did not bring this little slide I wanted to bring this and I didn't bring it. But what happens it to you know if you just drink too much milk and you eat solid food? Alright? Let's not even go there, right? The Bible says we've got to move from just kind of sipping a little milk to eating solid food, which means we're we're keeping step in the spirit, like I said yesterday, walking with the Lord. Alright? So relationship reality. Understanding how it really works. And today we're going to talk about Bible study. You excited about that? Woo! Yeah. yeah. Oh, Bible study. Alright, we're going to light up here. We're going to do 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And just, you can just follow the words as I read. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Alright? And, and the tremendous thing about these verses is that they lay out the reason why we're commanded to study the Bible. And we're going to talk about that this morning. You know, many say today that the words of God are inspired. And, and you know, and, and, um, and you, can, you can find a lot of truth in the Bible. Others say it's inspired like Shakespeare. I don't know if you're into all that. I, I never was. But you have to admire Shakespeare and all his writings and the way it's, it's altered cultures and things it's done. And people say, man, Shakespeare, man, it was inspired. I mean, that, that guy was just, wow. But there's a vast difference between the way the Bible is and the way, say, a, a Shakespearean work is. Shakespeare wrote some great works. But he just, the, in his imagination, was able to put to pen some wonderful things. But what we're going to see is that the Bible is not, and listen, listen to me now, the Bible is not something man-made. 
And we're going to look at this. This is truly the creator of the universe working through some men, having them write exactly what he wanted to write. It's not their opinion. It's not their will. It was God speaking to man. And he's laid out for us a map to live life and to live it more abundantly. There's only one way. It is God's way. And if you do anything other than what God wants, you are in sin because He is our Creator. We're going to stand before Him. So it's all written right here. Here's a, another great verse, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. You can just follow along. It says, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. <clears throat> if you've been in some Bible talks, especially as you get older, you'll always find some people that have a very unique interpretation that seems to be somewhat controversial or they've interpreted it their own way. And that's, that's not the right way. It's not, as it says, no prophecy of Scripture comes by someone's own interpretation. Now, verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. So the will of man did not write this. But men spoke from God as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. You know, as a preacher, I have to be very careful when I write messages that I am, that I am staying with what God has to say and that I'm not throwing in my own opinions or my own interpretations. It can be, I, can, I mean, it, it can, I can get carried away if I wanted to. I mean, if I decided, hey, I want the church to do this, or I want people to do this, or I want people to feel this way, and I'm going to lead the group this way, and I have my own agenda, I could probably pick out some passages and make them fit whatever I wanted them to fit to say. But that's not the way God works. Not at all. So, all Scripture means that every word of God is inspired. Alright? So what is the purpose of the Bible? Here we go. Who brought their Bibles? Let me see. Hold them up in the air. Every Bible, hold them up in the air. It's just good to bring them. Okay? Alright, put them down. How many brought a notebook? Put it up in the air. Put them up in the air. Alright, so start taking notes. We're getting ready here. And then I'm going to walk around and I'm going to check off everybody's notebook before they leave. Okay? I'm not going to do that. Alright? Here's what we're going to look at first. What is the purpose of the Bible? What is the purpose of the Bible? Well, it's twofold. First of all, salvation. First and foremost, the Bible tells us how to be saved. I know you've heard it a million times. How to be saved. That's what the Bible says. It is God's plan. It shows us that He created the world. He shows us how He's going to end the world. He shows us uh, all through the Old Testament that man can't do it by his own will. Isn't that crazy about the Old Testament? There's a list of laws about a mile long. If I was to take a scroll, you know, and, and, and just flap it out, it would just go out the door. All these laws that God said man must live by. <coughs> and he's leading up to Jesus. And God says this. This is really crazy. He says, you can keep all the laws. Think about this. Now listen to me. You can keep a whole list. And if you offend just one, you're guilty of them all. <coughs> What's he saying? He is saying that man will never be good enough. If you've ever thought one bad thought, one evil thought, if you've ever done one action that is, that is, that is sin in any way, any form, you've been separated from your God. Well, the Bible says you're born in a sin. We talked about this yesterday, didn't we? We're born little sinners. And so the Old Testament shows us we cannot live a life of our own and that we need God. And here comes Jesus. And Jesus, He goes to these wise men, these Pharisees and Sadducees who live by the law and they, they made sure the law was upheld and they said, this is the way to get to heaven. And he, who did He dispute with the most? He disputed with them. He said, uh-uh, I've come to give you something new. <clears throat> I am the Messiah. I'm going to do what you can never do. I am going to live a perfect life. I will never think a bad thought. I will always put others before myself. I have left all power and come down as a man. And given my, given my life so that anyone who calls upon my name will be saved. 
And then when I leave this world, I'm going to speak through these 12 men and their apostles, and I'm going to lay out how a Christian should live their life. And so that brings us to the second point, and that is Christian living. It is Christian living. Let, let me make it clear. Okay? How, but I want to encourage you because living God's way is the best way. But you'll never know that unless you dive in by faith and do it. But Christian living, the Bible lays out how we are to live. So that you can't, so that every man can't do what's right in his own eyes. But that's the world in which we live, isn't it? Everybody kind of determines what's right and wrong for themselves. Oh, hey man, if it's good for you, fine, but not for me, man. I'm doing another thing. I believe this is the right way. I'm going to do this. And when somebody comes along and says, hey, the Bible says that's wrong, we get all puffed up and angry. Why are we angry? Why do we get upset? Because we don't want to submit to somebody higher than ourselves. So the Bible tells us salvation. It tells us Christian living. And then the Word does several things from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And the first one, the Word teaches. The Word teaches us. It's an awesome, awesome instructor. instructor. Let, me, let me make something clear real quick. You, you probably know this. Okay? The Bible is the Word. John 1.1, 1, 1, how does the Gospel begin? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was God, and the Word was with God. This might be have to look at that for me. Because I know verse 2 says, He was with God in the beginning. Which means that Jesus Christ is the Word. So listen, I am telling you vivid things, hard to wrap your hand around. This, every single word of this, God is saying He is Jesus Christ. He is the Word. And God had this whole Bible mapped out, done, ready to go before He ever created the world. Case in point, anybody ever hear of the book of Revelation? Okay, It's about the end, isn't it? It's about how God's going to finish things. Well, guess what? That was written from the very beginning. And it hasn't happened yet. It's all been written. This is Jesus Christ. Okay? So it teaches us how to live. Here's another thing it does. It convicts us. Second thing is it convicts us. Or reproof in some Bibles. What is conviction? Hey, what is conviction? The Bible's all about slapping us in the face, isn't it? I mean, slap, slap, turn the other cheek. I mean, it, 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 it basically, we live our life, and then we read the Bible, and we're like, man, I... I probably shouldn't be doing some of the things I'm doing. I, I probably... I mean, it's convicting. And you know what real salvation is? I, you know, I believe a lot of people will, will sit in a chair and they'll say this. Yeah, I know a lot of my friends believe in Jesus. I want to believe in Jesus too. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Isn't He great? Jesus is great. But you don't find yourself living for Him. I, I believe a part of salvation is is you come to that knowledge when you read the Word of God and all of a sudden you realize, man, my sins have separated me from God. And if I don't accept Jesus Christ into my life, then I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to be eternally separated from God. And that's scary, isn't it? And that's convicting. And so you run down and you're like, oh God, please save me. I mean, what do you want to save you for? Because you know how evil you really are. It, it can be any age. But the older you get, the more you're aware of it. And you're like, oh, God, please. I remember as a 9 or 10, nobody wrote it down for me. I was at a Christian camp, and we used to call it the, uh, the um, Tabernacle, all right, in Shipshawana, Indiana. And I remember they were preaching, and I was in the back, and I was very young, 8, or, it was eight, nine, eight 9 or 10, somewhere in there. And I knew that, man, I was going to go to hell. There was no way I could get there on my own, and I wanted to be saved. And as a little boy, I got up, and if you can imagine me, because I'm so laid back and just, you know, tender, you know, I ran down to the front and said, i got to be saved. I saved it. And I remember the lady who opened up the Bible and showed me, and I remember giving my life to the Lord because I wanted to be with Him, and I knew my sin had separated. So it, was, it convicts. That's what the Word of God does. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. So it teaches, it convicts, and here's the third one that sets us right. That's correction. It puts us on the right path. Look, the Bible, I'm going to paraphrase, the Bible says, you know, look, broad is the path of destruction. 
that lead to death. I mean, it is so broad, basically, it's as wide as the world. And, and the whole world's heading that way. But he says, narrow is the path that leads to righteousness, salvation, eternity, in the presence of God. And the Bible says there are very few who find it. And I'll tell you this, this is alarming, and I want you to hear me this morning. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm going to let the Word of God convict you. The Bible says, when Jesus, on judgment, there are people stand before God. There are people who are going to say, I preached the Word. I raised the dead. Oh Lord, I led thousands to the Lord. God, I was part of this and I was part of that. And look what I did. And Jesus is going to look down and say, depart from me, I never knew you. Let's be honest. Every single one of us can be in church and be so far from God. You can be here this morning and say, oh, hallelujah God, but in your own thought life, in your own private places of your home, in relationships, whatever it may be, you give no thought to God. Case in point, very few spent, took that challenge to spend any time in prayer. You weren't concerned about being ready to meet with God this morning. Now, I'm not trying to meet or pick one. I'm just kind of going with the evidence here. I'm not trying to manufacture anything. I promise, okay? So it teaches, it convicts, it sets us right. And then the word, it disciplines. Nobody likes discipline, do they? I mean, I don't like discipline. My wife disciplines me all the time, and I don't like it. <laughs> don't. <laughs> she sets me straight and narrow. The Bible does discipline us. God says those He loves, He chastens. Here's another word. God says those He loves, He spanks. He does. God says, hey, you've given your life to me, and, 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 and now that you're my child, I will never let you go, and, and I'm only going to let you go so far, and I'm going to use people to speak to you and talk to you, that you'll kind of rein it in. Come back to me. But if not... I am going to put you over my knee symbolically and I'm going to give you the old one too. Schmack. And that can be God allowing things in your life to happen to wake you up. Wake up! No, okay. I didn't expect a little more there. All right. You guys are really in tune. I love it. Okay. All the teachers freaked out that you guys are doing fine. <laughs> Discipline. Tremendous, huh? That's what the Word does. That's why we need to be in it now. So you see, the best way to understand the Bible is, first of all, read your Bible daily. Read your Bible daily. Write that down in your notes. I don't know if I used this illustration last time I was here or not, but I'll, we'll see. Somehow I think I did. But I remember being in Bible college. Now, look, I didn't. Uh, let me give you a little history, real quick. I grew up in a split home. I mean, my mom, she's a hippie. You know what a hippie is? Like I would say, my mom went to Woodstock. Okay, she's still a hippie. My my stepdad's got tattoos on his body. I won't mention. My dad's the old farm boy. We might met her out in California. And so my parents split. My dad wanted to raise me a Christian. I know as much, I, I know as many Buddhist chants as a lot of Buddhists. I mean, I had, my mom would sit me down and make me learn Buddhism and, and this new age philosophy. Um, I won't name it so nobody goes looking it up. And then I would go, my dad would say, no, you're going to do this. And you want to talk about a conflicted young man. Let me tell you, you know, I, I didn't have the whole Christian background very well at all. Okay, and I didn't grow up reading my Bible every day by no stretch of imagination. So you know, kind of, kind of coming from that background, let you know a little bit about me. But when it comes to listen to reading your Bible daily, I mean, it has to be a practice. Okay, so getting back to my story a little bit, I remember being in Bible college, and that's a you can see my life was I had a lot of decisions to make. And when I went in the military and I lived overseas the whole time, it was a great time. But I met some believers. It really changed my life. God called me into ministry. And I was like, I'm going to the Bible college. Woo! Yeah, Lord, I'm all sold out. And I came home, and my dad and I were going to drive down to Florida. 
but we were going to make a pit stop at Fort Stewart and see my brother in the Army. So we made a pit stop, and we had a good time with my brother for like a day and a half. And then I told my dad, I said, you know what, Dad? Never mind. Just let's go home. He was, I was, I, anyway, I was on the way down to visit the college I was going to go to, Jacksonville, Florida. I had it all set up, because I was living in England. So I had to set it up before I came home. And, but I got down to Fort Stewart, Georgia, and I decided, no, I don't want to do it. I told Dad, let's go. I went home, flew back, kind of in rebellion against God. Anyway, a long set of circumstances happened in my life. I finally just sold out, and I get to Bible college, but I'm still unsure of like, what God's going to have me do, okay? I have no idea. I'm, I mean, I've been all over the map. I, I've heard everything. I'm trying to sell this in my heart. I'm, I, at this point, I am sold out for God, but I have so many questions. And I'll never forget this old guy. He gets up at Bible college. He's real old. Don't remember his name. Don't even remember what he preached. <laughs> But he says, I can sum up the ministry, your Christian life, in one word. And he paused. <coughs> and God just hit me. And I have my notebook. Because if I didn't, I'd get in trouble. <laughs> it was wired. I have my notebook. And, and I'm like, all right, Lord, this is it. And just give me this one word. This is going to change my life. I'm like, woohoo! Bring it on! And he said the word discipline. <coughs> discipline? Do you know what discipline means? It means you got to be disciplined. That's crazy. <laughs> the Christian life is discipline. That's what helped me grow. I realized it's not about how I feel. It has nothing zip, not about my feeling. Because I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, not being a morning person, I don't want to get out of bed. Can anybody say hallelujah? Oh. No. I don't want to get out of bed. Some of you may love the Lord. I believe you want to get up and get here this early, right? Discipline is, is saying, you know what? I love you, God, more than this sinful body loves itself. The flesh I live in, I mean, it craves a lot of things. It does. And my whole life is a battle of spending time with God and reigning in what this wants. I mean, what the old flesh, what it wants, it wants. Sometimes way too much food. It wants. But, but, but in my heart, I read the word of God. He says, spend time reading with me every day. There's only one, time you, only one way you can spend time with God every day. And that's to read your Bibles. Do it. You do it in the morning, it's the best time. Do it in the evening. Do it both. You don't have to spend hours upon hours. Just spend time with God. Spend 15 minutes reading the Bible. Spend 15 minutes in prayer. But we have to be students of the Word our whole life. Let me tell you something. I, I was a youth pastor for years. Didn't give you that whole story. But I was a youth pastor in Florida, West Virginia, North Carolina, Indiana, you know, loving the Lord, doing some great work with youth ministry. And I, I, I'm sold on the fact that if you don't get this discipline now at your age, you probably never will. It is easier now than it ever will be the older you get. If you don't develop it now, it won't happen. So basically, we can just leave here and say, look, if I can't love the Lord now, if I can't learn to spend time with Him now, I probably never will. But that's okay with me because I'm, I'm more important. Don't have that philosophy. All right? Spend time in the Word. Okay? So read your Bibles daily. Here's the second one. This is going to hit home. Surround yourself with people who love the Word and study the Word. Right, I'm just going to say it. You ready? I'm just going to say it. Choose your friends very carefully. Yeah. If you hang around people who don't give a rip about God, they're going to suck you down and you're going to go off into an oblivion. And you're going to look back one day and say, I wish I would have done things differently. You cannot call people who aren't Christians your friends. Now let me, I know that sounds terrible. We're friendly, right? We're friendly and we reach out and we spend time with people who are not Christians. We do. But what is a friend? Friends are people who have, who have similar thoughts about life, who can connect, right? Who can, who can just, they're friends because, man, they just get each other. And, and, and they love spending time because that's what friends do. But the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. <coughs> what, does, you know, what does darkness have with light? We're the salt of the world. And, and, how you sh and the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. Right? That means you know, two, 
two friends in the Lord, they sharpen each other. They make each other better for Jesus Christ. And this is a true test of a believer. If I really love the Lord, if I want to grow, I may not necessarily pull away and never have anything to do with people, but I'm going to have to reevaluate how much time I spend with people who are helping me achieve what I want to be in life. And you've seen it. You know as well as I do. You know people who are having problems in life. And we pray for them and we love them, but they tend to cling together, don't they? And we have to choose our friends wisely. We have to surround ourselves with people who are going to make us better. To listen to me, it is that important. It's what the Word of God says. You may not like it. it, it there was a time when I had a problem with it. But God knows what He's doing. And here's the third one. Find a church and be a church. Be is capitalized because tending church is not what I'm talking about. By the way, let me clarify what church is. Right? Let me clarify what church is. Church is a group of believers who meet together. It's not the building. It's not the programs. It's not how much they offer. It's believers in genuine fellowship ministering to one another. All right? So we're at, this is church right here. And if we decided we wanted to go out in the middle of the field and sit down, this building ceases to be chapel and church, and it's out there wherever we're gathered. The church is God's people. Let me, let me just prove a case in point. All right? And I don't want to blow you away too much. Where does the temple of the Holy Spirit reside, won't you say? It's in us. Right? Right? And so, you've got to find a church and be in church. Be involved with people and in relationships. See, I'm not going to pick one of the worst ones. There's a good one because you're up here. You can, you can come to church, say hi. How you doing? How you doing? Great to see you. Then you can come up here and play. And maybe not here at any church. Say you go to church and you play music. Well, you're, you're helping to lead worship. But that's, that's, that's the superficial stuff we do together. It's very needed. Not, I don't want to diminish it. But where real church is, is where we're involved in ministry together. Where iron sharpens iron. Right? Look, I'm preaching to you. I'm leading the church. But I don't necessarily consider this being in church. Because I have to surround myself with other people also who hold me accountable. Who, who make me better. Who will challenge me if I'm getting off. They know me well enough. And, and, and we help one another through good and bad times. You understand? Find a church. Be in church. Because God created us to be relational. Let me put it this way, all right? God said, I'm almost done. Uh, you know, God is enough. But in this life, God knows that He's... He's, he, we need more than just Him. And that's why He gave Adam Eve. And that's why the church has people in relationships, okay? It's very important. Alright? So we're just about done. Let me give you tonight's challenge, alright? Put up tonight's challenge. Spend 15 minutes in your bed, you think it's a good place, or next to your bed, you know, the door closed. And I want you to begin reading God's Word. It, 15 minutes is not that hard. And my suggestion is maybe you start through the Gospel of John. That's pretty good. Um, when Mr. Church comes up, you might have able to give you something else. Some of you may be Proverbs. You need some wisdom? Start reading Proverbs every night. All right? But tonight, just spend some time in God's Word. If you get in the Gospel of John, it's good. don't just flip the Bible over and go, Okay, God, uh, here we go. It, 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 it might be dangerous what you read out of context. <laughs> begin, or read through Proverbs and begin. That's a great book. If you're like, I need some help, I need some wisdom, that's a great book. <laughs> Ask one of your teachers, say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. This is an area I'm weak in. Where, where can I go to read tonight for 15 minutes to help me? All right, do a little homework on it. Now, I ask you to find accountability partners. Find an accountability partner, and tonight, you need to text each other, call each other, email each other, whatever it takes. Don't, don't spend too much time on the phone, right? right? And, and hold each other accountable. Can everybody find accountability partner just to say, hey, let's read the word? Everybody can do that, right? All right. Raise your hand if you can find accountability partner. Can I be an accountability partner? Listen, you spend more than 15 minutes with her, I promise you. All right. Find an accountability partner. Let me read this and I'm done. Alright? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, Raise 